So this, I want a continuation from last week's sermon a little bit when we were talking about being slaves to sin. How our continuing dattling with sin, how it becomes a strand. And if you continue to daddle in it, then it becomes a cord. That cord will wrap you up and take you prisoner by Satan. You become a prisoner of Satan and you're locked into that sin. But there were things that the Holy Spirit wanted me to share with you today. And it's very important. I tried to do all this in about 30 minutes because I'm finding out that people, they like to listen to these sermons on YouTube. And these sermons are from those who are watching on Facebook right now live. That you can go to YouTube, type in Swansboro Church of God, and also you'll see the Swansboro Church of God symbol come up, which is a cross with a kind of like an at sign, and it's colorful. And you click on the term Swansboro Church of God symbol, and you'll get all my sermons. And you have to hit all, and all of them that I've got posted on there, there, all the girls that are singing, all their songs, uh, like we did for Christmas, like Mary Did You Know, and all those songs. Every one of those are pretty much on the YouTube channel as well. But so those of you who cannot hear me very well, live on Facebook, uh, I will post this sermon this week uh, on YouTube. Those of you who did not hear my sermon last week, you can go to YouTube and look up the title, Slave to Sin, and you'll be able to listen to it. It's about 37 minutes. Amen? Amen. So, one of the things that God has put on my heart is that a lot of people have a misconception of eternal life. They really do. God said, Jesus God said, that many are called but only a few are chosen. And now this ain't no Jehovah Witnesses type of sermon where only 144,000 are going to get in there. You understand what I'm saying? No, this is based on your belief and your commitment and your obedience. Faith without works is dead. So Jesus says even the devils believe that he is God. But so not only do the first part you got to have is belief, then you got to have works along with that belief, and it's what? Obedience. There must be obedience. And belief with obedience equals eternal life. Amen? So, Jesus, we had a situation. He used parables to explain a lot of what things we do not understand about his kingdom and how to get into his kingdom. So he gives us this one parable of this young man who goes to Jesus. So I want to talk about him just for a moment first. So I want to so the pass and review just a little bit. Next slide. So it says that our honor of God is what? Expressed in outward acts. What is our outward acts? It's pure and unblemished in the sight of God. The Father is this. According to James 1.27. It's to keep oneself unspotted and contaminated from the world. That's what our what the expectation says. Okay, so let's look at the next slide then. Next slide says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You are, now the works of the flesh, the outward acts, are these, are manifested in these. Fortification. What's fortification for those of you who don't know that big word? It's sex outside of marriage. Then he uses uncleanness, Leviticus, which is, I, I had to look it up myself one time, and so I decided if I had to look it up, maybe you might need to look it up. His habitual inclination to unrestrained sexual behavior. I adultery, what's that? That's anything. Anything. Spouses, children, grandchildren, parents, careers. Money, anything that is more important to you than your relationship for eternal life. Witchcraft, hatred, strife. What kind of hatred will do? 
hatred of God said that if you hate somebody, you are the same thing as a murderer. That's what he says. He says if you look as, at a woman as to have in your heart, your desire in your heart to have sex with her and you're married, you've already committed adultery. So you've got to be, uh, pay attention to some of this stuff that God says. And he says other stuff like strife and jealousy and wrath and robberies and division, sex and enemies and drunkenness, reveling, such things of these which, here it is, what he said. He says what I told you before in Romans. This is Apostle Paul talking to you. The Apostle Paul says, those who do such things, what? Shall not inherit it. Listen to that word. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? It's eternal life. How do we know that? So let's look at the next slide. So here's the young man. He runs up to Jesus and he asks him this very important question. What must I do to inherit, that's that word again, inherit eternal life and we're the kingdom of God? See, the question before James put out was, what those who do such things will shall not inherit in the kingdom of God? Here is, what should I do to inherit eternal life in the kingdom of God? So what he says, Jesus says, he first of all establishes one very important thing right off the bat. He says to him, he says, why do you call me perfectly essentially good? There is only one who is good, perfectly good, God alone. So he established right off the fact that God alone he was talking to. So this is what Jesus told him. If you want to what? Inherit eternal life, you must what? Continually keep my commandments. What are what some of the commandments? Do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not tell lies, do not be dishonest, honor your father and your mother. These are some of the both things that are taken out of the parable from Mark and Matthew. Next slide. So what does he say? He replies, he says, I carefully have guarded and asserted all these and taken care not to violate any of these from my boyhood. And Jesus looking upon, notice what? Jesus loved him. Loved him. He says, then he says, go and sell everything that you have and come and follow me. And notice what happens. He says, said that saying, the man's countenance failed. Have you ever seen somebody's countenance just fall and was gloomy? And he went away grieved and sorrowing. That is such an important thing that you need to understand what I'm going to be talking about in the future here in a little while. Jesus said, how hard is it for those who put their trust and place their confidence and their sense of safety and money to enter what? In the kingdom of God. If money is an issue with you, and it doesn't, you don't have to be rich for money to be your idol. You can be outright in poverty and poor. And if money is still an issue, and you put your trust in it before you put your trust in God, your careers, your jobs, whatever it is, and it's, you put your trust there before you put it in, in God, your trust, then that money is an idol to you. Because what if Jesus says, he continues to go on furthermore. Let's see what else he says. He says, Jesus says, everyone who has, who has given up, given up and left house, house, money, careers, brothers, sisters, mother, father, your parents, your children, your lands, your possessions, in other words, for my sake and for the gospel, will receive a hundred times as much. When, when will you receive this? There goes my PowerPoint. We might need to get a breaker back there. So it looks like it's coming back on. All right, here we go. And it says, houses, brothers, sisters. He says, here it is. 
Did all this go off? Yeah, we lost yes. all like we lost 30 seconds. How about, did this come back on? Mm. Look and see if record is on, we have to hit record. That's still going. Yeah, it looks like it's still record. going. It's got the same record. Uh oh. No. Jacob? Yeah, it says this is recording. It says RECN on yep. top? Yep. Okay, it's recording. Okay. So that's trying to reconnect. And that's trying to reconnect, okay. And so what's happening? He's saying, what's Jesus saying? Yeah, the devil does not want this information getting out. Mm, that's right. Come on. He says, he says that if you will give up everything, what do you say? To serve him, it requires what? You must deny self, surrender yourself to me, is what he said. Surrender yourself to me and do what? Bear your cross. In other words, put up with whatever hardships that you have to put up with. And follow me and be my disciple. That's what it requires to inherit eternal life. He says, if you do that, he says, you will receive all these things when in this time. It'll come with persecutions, but you'll have it in this time. He says, not only in this time, but in the age to come. Now, some of you need to understand some things really quick to help you understand certain things. Christians in the past. You know, when Jesus gave us the parable of the sower, he says, there are those who hear the word, and they just don't care for the word. They hear it, but it does not go into their heart. What's the matter, son? And he says, and it does not go into their heart. And he says, these are people who just don't have no desire to be a Christian. They, they don't understand it. They don't care to understand it. How many of you got friends, family members who just do not desire to ever just want to be a Christian? They don't want a Christian life. They have no one of any parts of it. There are those, he said, that will be that way in this world that just don't want this life or eternal life. And you know why he said it? Because they just don't understand it. So those are the ones that you must pray for their eternal life. Why? He says you must dig up that hard ground so it will become a soil that it eventually, when the seed is sown into that soil, that that seed, that seed will produce eternal life in them. But the only way that that seed can ever get produce eternal life is it's got the ground has got to change from heart. And the only way that that ground changes is by your prayers for that person's eternal life. You're digging up their hard heart and changing it into their good ground. Then he says there are those who hear the word and receive it. But because it was in thorny ground, and what happened to it? He says when persecutions come, trials come, people made fun of them because they were Christian. Hey, they couldn't go out and party with their friends no more. They didn't couldn't change their lives no more. You know, and if... They had, they, it required a life change. They was like, no, this is not for me. As soon as they were too embarrassed to bow their heads and pray for their food in front of people, afraid that they were going to laugh at them, hey, they gave it up. They gave up eternal life and went back into slavery underneath Satan again. And there are those who you see who come to church. You think, yes, your family member came to church. Your friend came to church. They accepted Jesus. Finally, as soon as they got some persecution, now they're back out doing the same old stuff that they were doing. Why? They never inherited. They, their, their spirit turned from light, from darkness to light, from separation to God to God, but then they were disinherited. What did they do? They went back underneath, back into Egypt. Back into the world again. But then let me tell you about somebody. This is the tricky ones. He said there are those who accept the word. He says but then their lives are in thorns. These are those. He says that chokes the word of God. Out of them. What is the word of God inside of them. Is their internal life. Which is Jesus. He says it chokes the word. What chokes the word? The deceitfulness of riches. What else? The pleasures of other things entering in. What else? Anything 
that you put that's in your life that you don't want to give up like this rich man. See, he had been, these are those who come to church. Sometimes it's kind of spotty off and on. Sometimes they come every Sunday. They even get involved in church. But they got that one thing in their life. They just won't give up. See, the rich man would not give up his money. He would not give up that to follow Jesus and become his disciple. What is it that it, there is possibility that in all these, some of these people who come into our church and sit here, the thing that's happening, some of the sex, they can't give up their sexual life. They like sex too much. And they just, they want to become a Christian, they do everything else good, but they still go on out and have sexual relationships. That's that one thing that's keeping them from what? Having eternal life. He says why? It choked the word. It choked the word. How about others? Too many pleasures. Too many other things to do on Sunday. Let's get out. Let's go to the beach. And let's go boating. Let's, let's, you know, we got other things we want to do. Anything that's in your life that chokes the word, that becomes a little bit too much important, then giving up everything that God requires you to give up for eternal life will keep you from inheriting. What were some of the things that we just read a few minutes ago? Unforgiveness. Bitterness. Hatred. These were just iniquities that weren't even mentioned. What is it that's choking the word in your life that's causing you not to inherit it? Then he said that those who do what? Receive it into a good heart. A person who is doing what? How many of you remember when you accepted Jesus Christ? How, how it felt? How excited you were? Your life was changed. You were excited. You couldn't wait to tell your friends, your family members that you were saved and you loved Jesus. And you started, you hated sin. Anything that had, had, had the word sin on it, you kind of, you just hated it. Now let's talk about the person. So these are people that we talked about who might not have ever really inherited eternal life because they just were not willing to give up their faith of sin. They just were not willing to give up whatever that one thing is that's keeping them from honestly becoming Jesus' disciple. And then there are those who like us, like me, like yourselves, who, whose hearts were changed, really changed. And all of a sudden you went back into the world. You lost your inheritance. Let's talk about that person for a moment and what it takes to come back and attain your inheritance back again. See, a lot of Satan sent a lot of false preachers out there to teach you. Once saved, always saved. To teach you that you can have your cake and eat it too. To teach you that you can commit sedition, betrayal, and an adultery against God and still think you're going to get to go to heaven. I'm going to tell you something. I use this all the time. Christy, if Tommy says that he wants to be your husband every day of the week except for one day, and that one day he wants to go see his old girlfriends, have a good time with them, maybe a little hanky-panky with them, how are you going to feel about that, Christy? Are you going to let him go do that? Is that okay with you? No, I didn't think so. And if he continues to do so, after a while, I mean, you can forgive him, you know, maybe even sometimes. But after a while, if he refuses to give it up, then there's a thing because you're going to divorce him. 
and you're going to say, we're, we're, you're no longer my husband. Because why? See, with God, you can't be a 99% Christian. You can't be a 99% in a relationship and think that it's okay to commit adultery and betray someone in that relationship every now and then and think it's going to be okay. Because it's not okay. It's the same thing with God. How would you, you think you're going to treat God any different? When you commit adultery against him. And what's adultery against him? It's when you go out and start hooking up with his most worst enemy in the world, which is Satan, his fallen angels, and his demons. God don't like it any more than you would in this world if someone in your relationship is betraying you. So there are those who, who really accept Jesus. And then this is what happened to us. Next slide. And there was a certain man that had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the part of my property that falls to me. And he divided his state between them. And not many days after that, the younger son, with his inheritance, what? His what? Say it. Inheritance. Say it again. Inheritance. He did what? He journeyed into a distant country. That's not God's country. He went into it. And he did what? He wasted his what? His inheritance with reckless and loose living. That's you Christians who have accepted Jesus. There was a change that took place in your heart. And then you slipped back into the world. You went back into that distant country that you came out of and you wasted your eternal life, your inheritance with reckless and loose living. I know I'm not the only one who's ever done that. I'll admit to you, I've done it. There was a time in my life that I, what we Christians call backsliding, that I completely and totally backslid. I'm going to tell you what, how bad it was, too. Next slide. And he spent all he had. There it was. He lost his inheritance. And once he lost his inheritance, this is the thing that you need to understand. When, you, when you're a Christian, and you go back into Satan's territory, back into his land, and you journey into his land, he's going to make life absolutely hell for you here on this earth. Why? Because, see, you became light. And he's going to cause a mighty famine to come in your life. And all your friends, people, now that you thought you were your friends, all these people who were not saved, that you made your friends, hanging out with old family members who were not saved, and you thought they got your interests at heart, well, Satan is going to bring absolutely famine, persecution. What's it like when you become a person of war? Because once you give up your inheritance and you go back into his land, you become his prisoner. What happens when you're a prisoner? Those of you in the military understand it, don't you, Patrick? Absolutely. It's torture. You're subjected to their treatments of torture. And pain. You eat whatever they give you to eat. You take your beatings. Constant. Constant beratement. You become a prisoner of war and he's going to put you with the pigs. Because if you take those friends those unsaved friends, or you're really your friends when you get in a time of need? They're not the who are going to be your friends. Your friends are going to send you to the field when you're in need and you need help. They're going to send you to the field with the pigs. And this is what happened. This is the, what Jesus used in this parable to give you an example. How bad your life will be 
if you decide to become a prisoner of war to Lucifer, to Satan and his fallen angels, your life will eventually end up in with the pigs. And let's keep going. What else did he say? He says, in 2 Peter, Peter said, For they, after have escaped the defilements of this world, you become born again, you escape the defilements of this world, through what? The knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And there again you're entangled in the defilements of this world, and you're overcome again, your last state has become worse than your first. Why has your last state become worse than your first? Because you're now a prisoner of war and Satan is your captor. He's the one who's going to torture you and beat you and put you in absolute fire poverty. Hurt your family members. You lose your protection. You lose everything that God promised you. Your family members will start falling away. They start getting hurt. There's no more safety and protection. You're... Oh, it's so bad. It says, for it would have been better, listen, for them to never have known the way of righteousness and after knowing it, they turn back from the holy commandments delivered to them. For here are why, here's what God says about you. Not about you, but about those. About me one time. He says, it's the same as the dog returns home. Everybody ever seen a dog throw up and then turn around and eat his vomit? Anybody ever seen that? I've seen it. It grossed me out. I was trying, jumping on that dog as hard as I could. Get out of that stuff! That's like the nastiest thing I ever saw. That's why God says that we're like when we get entangled back into the things of this world. When we become, he says our worst state is, our state is worse than, he says we're like a dog who returns to him. Listen, he says, you remember the parable of the man? His life was in the pig's pen. He says, you're like the pig after washing yourself. Then you go back and get in the pig crap and start wallowing around in that pig crap again. He says, that's what it's like for you. Next slide. It's horrible, folks. It's horrible. Your life is, will give. If it's not there and you have backslid, if it's not there yet, it will get there. It will get there. And it will get down, it will get that bad until one thing happens. But we'll talk about that one thing in a moment. Because I need to talk to some people. Somebody needs to hear this. Next slide. Look at Revelations 2, 3, and 5. Rouse yourself and keep awake and strengthen and invigorate that what remains and is on the point of dying. What's on the point of dying? He's talking about your eternal life. He says, for I've not found a thing that you've done any good any good works of yours meeting the requirements of my God. Perfect in his sight. So call to mind the lessons that you receive and heard, which were what? Continually lay them to your heart, obey his word, and repent. And here it is. Here's a, a word that you must remember if you ever want to get your eternal life back if you lost it. If you gave up your inheritance. So you can give up your eternal life. And people didn't know it. Because here's what it says. He says, rouse yourself and keep awake. And watch. He who is victorious will be clad in what? White garments. And I will not what? Erase or blot his name from the book of life. Yeah, there it is. It's in there. For all those of you who believe once saved, always saved. Your name had to be written in the book. To have it erased. It had to be written in it. To be blotted out. He says. Clad yourself in white garments. There's an apartment. And the reason why he says so. He said keep yourself. Unspotted. And uncontaminated. And not contaminated. Uncontaminated from this world. 
Folks, you can't think it's okay that a little sin ain't a little dab. What does the Bible say? The little leaven does what? Leaven the whole lot. What leaven is he talking about? Sin. It says just a little bit of sin in your life will eventually leaven the whole lot. Let's keep looking at what God said. What is he talking about? Well, let's back up, Jacob. Back up, Jacob. What is he talking about here? These are those of you who have lost your first love. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about these here, here in Revelation 3 who have lost your first love. Do you remember that love feeling that you had with Jesus when you first were born again? How the excitement you were? How you couldn't wait? I'm almost finished. How you couldn't wait to tell people about Jesus? How you couldn't wait to get on your knees and pray? How you couldn't wait to read the Word of God? You couldn't wait to get to church! You were excited about coming to church. Have you lost that desire? Have you lost your desire to come to church? Do you only come once a month, twice a month, because you just kind of lost that desire to come? Do you lost your desire to open up the Bible and read some chapters? Get down on your knees and worship Him. Spend some time talking to Him. Where is your first love? If you lost your first love, He says you can't have your name blotted out from the book of life. And He says if you lost that first love, He says you better do what? You better rouse yourself, strengthen, invigorate yourself, because you're at the point of dying, folks. Some of you have lost that first love. And you need to get that first love back. How many of you this week, did you read your Bibles this week? Did you? No, you don't have to raise hands. Because there's too many that might not raise their hands. <laughs> did you read your Bibles this week? Did you find some time during the day to talk to your God? Not only to pray for your family, not only to pray for your children or your grandchildren, not only to pray for your friends or your neighbors, not only to ask God to save those who have hard hearts and pray for their hearts so that it will become good ground, so maybe when the seed is sown, it will go into a good ground and produce what eternal life in them? Have you spent time just worshiping him and telling him, my God, I am so glad that you came into my life and gave me eternal life. That you found me. That you're keeping me. You're watching me. You're giving angels to watch over me, to preserve, defend, and accompany me everywhere I go. Do you take time to worship him? Did you see the, the words on that song that all I got left to offer you is race hands? That's all I got left, God, to offer you is a heart that is completely devoted to you. Do you hate sin or do you enjoy your little favorite sins? Where is your first love? Who is your first love? He says, those who want eternal life. He says, well, do what? He says, you will love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your being, with everything that is inside of you. You will love me. Do you love him like that? Or have you just allowed too many pleasures of this world Distractions of other things, distractions, too much TV, too much work, too much whatever it is, distractions of this world to keep you from a few minutes, 168 hours in one week, and you can't find out 168 hours to take just 10 minutes a day. Tell God, thank you. Just 
Thank you. Next slide. It says, those who have not sold their clothes, notice the word soil, their clothes. They shall walk with me in white because they are worthy and deserving. And then you read in Revelation, he says, I saw the heavens open. And a white horse was standing there, and his rider name was Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. We're talking about the Lord Jesus. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood. What was his title? The Word of God. Jesus, the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, who do you think the armies are? And they were dressed out in pure white linen. He says in Revelations, I did not blot their names out of the book of life. Why? Why I did not blot their names out of the book of life? Because they had not sold their clothes. For they shall walk with me in white because they are worthy and discerning. Are you worthy and discerning? In yourself, never. In the righteousness of Christ Jesus, yes. But if you think that you can continue going out and doing and committing whatever sins you want to commit and living whatever type of contaminated life you want to live and never spending time with Him, never getting to know Him, oh, come on, folks, nobody's that foolish. But Satan will try to keep you so distracted to cause you to what? Who's your first love. And you can tell when you start listening to first love. You just don't have the desire to go to church. You just don't have the desire to read your Bible no more. You just don't have the desire to obey His commandments. You just don't have the desire to spend some time on your knees praying for others and just worship with Him. You just don't have that desire to get involved in the ministry. You just don't have a desire. What happens when we're Christians? Before we, and what God will do for us, to us, to keep us from losing our eternal life. Next slide. He says, look what he says. He says, put the death therefore exactly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desire, and covetousness. Which is, what did he call all this stuff? Idolatry. Any of these things he called it idols. Why? Because he says, on account of these things, God's wrath is going to come. But it says, look at what he says in Hebrews. This is a hard scripture. It's a painful scripture. He says, for if we go on deliberately and will be sinning after acquiring the knowledge of the truth, becoming truly saved and born again, there is no longer any sacrifice left to atone for our sins. Look, Jesus is not going back to the cross to die for you again. You cannot put him back on the cross for you. It don't work that way. He says there's no further offering to look forward. There's nothing left but a what? An awful and fearful prospect and expectation of divine judgment and furry burning wrath and indignation which will consume those who put themselves in opposition to God. If you go willfully and deliberately and continue to sin, God, two things will take place. One, you will lose your eternal life, eventually. Two, God will punish you to try to get you, just like a child. You got that three-year-old daughter, right? What's her name? Riley, sir. Riley. Yep. You love that girl? Absolutely. I'm telling you, Patrick, you saw Riley out there playing on Highway 24 where she could get hurt. Are you going to punish that young lady after you've told her not to get on that road whatsoever and you catch her on that road? Will she get some form of punishment to save her life? Because you know that she goes out there and plays on that road, she's eventually going to get killed and she's going to die and lose her life. Would you not, out of love, punish that child to make them want to save their life? That's what God does for us. 
When you're willfully, deliberately sinning, he will punish you. Why does he punish you? And what does he consider it when you willfully, deliberately continue to sin? What does he consider it? Look at the next slide. He says, for those punishment, do you suppose will be just who to serve, who have what? Spurned and just trampled underfoot the Son of God who has considered the covenant blood by which was consecrated common and hallowed, thus profaning it, and insulting and outraging the Holy Spirit who imparts grace. Listen to me and tell you folks. Grace, God's grace, for those of you who think God's grace is for you can go out and sin and go to heaven, it's, that's what it's not for. God's grace is He punishes you so that you won't lose your eternal life. That's His grace. He says you Trample underfoot his name. You profane his blood. And you outrage God the Holy Spirit. So yes, that's like your child out there. When you told that baby, don't get out there on Highway 24 or get on the road and play. That baby there in his rebellion and he knows that child, she or he knows they're not supposed to be on the road. And they know it. And they say, I don't care what mom and dad said. I'm going to go out there and play on it anyway. They have profaned your name. That child has. Next slide. This is how you come back. He came to himself. Folks, if you've ever backslidden, or you're in a backslidden state now, or you're on a walk back to the Father, you got to come to yourself. And you got to realize what you lost. This is reflected of the sinner when he or she discovers the destitute condition of their life because of sin. It's a realization that without God there is no hope. Next slide. i got to finish up. He says, I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. For I am no longer worthy to be called your child. Next slide. So he got up and came to his father. While he was still away, the father saw him, was moved with pity and tenderness for him. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And he said, he said, and, and the son said to him, the son, the one who had backslid, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you in your sight. I am no longer worthy because your son. And what did the father say? He says, because my son was what? Dead. He had lost his internal life. He gave up his inheritance. He was dead. But now he's happy. The father's rejoicing because he's what again? He's alive again. He has eternal life again. It's back. It's been restored. Look, if you are backslidden, God will restore your eternal life. But listen, you can't just be sorry. You know, sorry is just, most of the time it's because you got caught. That's what sorry is. No. When you come to yourself, there's that deep tearing of your heart. I don't know if anyone has ever been there like I have where I've thrown myself down on my face before God. And there was a deep tearing, rendering of my heart. Just pure grieving and sorrow for what I had given up. And I was like, God, I don't deserve it. I, I just don't deserve you. I don't deserve it no more. It was no more just being sorry. But there was a grief there. A true sorrow there. And when you have that true grief and that true sorrow of your behavior, of your, your life, and I'm going to tell you what God says he'll do. Right there's what Jesus said. This is Jesus talking. He says she was dead. And because of that True grief and that true sorrow. Not just you're sorry because you went out sin. 
and you made me unhappy. No, because you want your inheritance back. God will give you inheritance. But your folks, you don't ever want to wait too long. If you've lost your inheritance, you don't ever want to wait too long. I think that's it on my last slide. What's the next thing? So in conclusion, folks, there are a lot of people who think they're Christians and they're like the young man who he just never gave up about one thing in your life that kept you from attaining or inheriting eternal life. He just never got there. There are those. What was it? Your parents didn't like you being a Christian. Your family didn't like it. Your friends didn't like you being a Christian. Your money, your career interfered with you being a Christian because you don't like giving money to the church. What is it? Sex. Bitterness, unforgiveness, you just can't forgive somebody. Hatred, you have hatred towards somebody. You, and you, you just, just. You envy other people. You lust after other things. Not just women or men. I'm talking about you lust after other people's houses and their cars. Look, God says if you gave up everything. See, this is the thing that most people understand. If you gave up everything for him. Everything, just like this, he told this young rich man, if he had given up everything, the one thing that he coveted was his money. If he had given up everything, he said he in this in his life then he would have been, and he would have been given back to him even a hundred times more than the wealth that he already had. In this life. But too many people are trying to hang on to that one little thing, like that rich man was his money. And just cannot let it go. And you won't ever inherit your eternal life. He says to the, little, the young man who went away grieving and sorrowing because he didn't get to inherit it. And Jesus loved him. And the guy said he did everything right. He just couldn't get rid of that one thing. But then he got those of us who really, <coughs> truly, our, our spirits changed. We know our spirits change. But we lost our we lost our first love. It's just let this world. It just started backing off. Slowly, slowly. It didn't happen overnight. You didn't wake up one overnight and become say I'm basement. <coughs> no, it's a slow process. But until you find yourself not going to church no more. Not having this. Look, I'm telling you. All you have to do. All you have to do, God said, was truly, truly surrender yourself to me. Bear your cross. What can your cross be? People making fun of you. That might be that's your cross. Whatever your cross is, bear it. He says, obey my commandments become my disciple, being his disciple. Folks, how many of you want eternal life in here? Come on. So your hands. How many want eternal life? I do too. I do not want to spend not one second in here. Tommy, I'm going to call you up. You can cut, cut the film. Tommy, I'm going to call you up. I'm going to anoint you.